All right, it is straight up the noon hour. Welcome everybody to Ag Forestry to Go webinar series. This is the second in our series that we started last month, so welcome. My name is Kara Kalber. I am the program manager for the Ag Forestry Leadership Program. I've been the program manager there for two years, but I am also the education director at the Franklin Conservation District in Pasco. And I've been um, delivering environmental education programming um, in schools for the last 15 years for the Conservation District. So welcome everybody from the Ag Forestry world, from the Conservation District world, and even some from counties and cities. Welcome to our webinar series. And we really hope today that you are going to get some tips and tricks on how to host a successful online meeting or webinar. Hang on just a sec. <laughs> okay, quick introductions. I would like to introduce the other uh, presenters with me today. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Nicole Ambertson. She is the Science and Planning Coordinator at the Whatcom Conservation District. She's also Adjunct Professor at Washington State University, Go Cougs, Director of the Washington Discovery Farms Program and Chair of the Center for Technical Development. She works with partners, agencies, and conservation districts around the state to improve programs, policies, and expertise through better information and training. I would also like to introduce to you today, Shauna Joy, who is the Regional Manager Coordinator for the Washington State Conservation Commission. Shauna joined the Conservation Commission in 2014, and prior to joining the commission, she worked in Alaska for the Alaska Department of Natural Resources as the Executive Director of the Natural Resource Conservation and Development Board. This was a position she held for five years, and in that role, she closely uh, worked with 12 diverse uh, conservation districts statewide, as well as state and federal agencies, uh, and working with those leaders to advance conservation districts in Alaska. So this is our, our panel today that we're going to be leading uh, you through some tips and tricks on how to deliver online webinars and meetings. And of course, we're going to explain what the difference is between those as well. So first, let's do a quick bit of housekeeping. We are gonna take questions throughout the webinar. We would like you to um, type those into the question and answer box. You'll see those in the, the, pan the tool panel at the bottom. Um, and you just type on, on there your question and we will get to those um, throughout the webinar. And we all also have a, a, a break at the end for questions and answers. You can also raise your hand if you open up the panelist box, I'm sorry, the participant box and you see the list of attendees, you'll also see some options at the bottom. There is a, yep, Sarah just raised her hand. So you'll see there's an opportunity to raise your hand and ask questions. Um, as well. So let me just make sure Sarah didn't have a quick question. Okay, so you can also lower your hand by, by clicking on that hand as well. Finally, we are going to be posting this webinar recording on our Ag Forestry website. We have a, 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 an events list and then you can just scroll down there and find that under our webinar series. All right, so jumping right in. Okay, so why host an online meeting? Well, I think as most of you have learned, like I have, this is our new norm, right? And I think we're finding that there are lots of uh, pros to doing online webinars and meetings. And we may not actually go back to the old style as much as we, we want to revert to normalcy. Uh, some of the advantages of hosting an online meeting or webinar are probably gonna pay off in the long run and we may keep some of those uh, moving forward. So what are some of those things? For instance, having online meetings and webinars, as you I'm sure have seen already, they save time and money. So time equals money, right? So think about the time that you spend in traveling to meetings. I know in the conservation district world, you're often traveling maybe to other conservation districts. You're going out to uh, board meetings, you're going to meet with producers and things like that. All of those opportunities now are some, sometimes being transferred onto the online portal. And so that saving that travel time, saving the gas, it's saving sometimes the food costs that you might need to, to uh, put in for feeding your, your attendees at your meeting. Um, having a meeting online or a webinar 
also can reach a much broader audience. It can be global. So do me a quick favor and raise your hand if you have participated in an online meeting or webinar and you've had people from around the world participate with you, raise your hand. So you'll wanna look at that participants list. Okay, so we have several of you. Okay, so from around the world. Now raise your hand. You can keep your hand raised for those. Raise your hand now if you've had other participants from around the United States. Great. So see we're able to reach larger audiences. Now just raise your hand if you were able to reach other people outside your county but within the state of Washington. Okay, so you're, you're statewide. Wonderful, 24 people, 25. Okay, so as you can see, being able to move online allows you the flexibility of expanding your reach. Um, and without the cost of travel, you know, uh, plane tickets and things like that. It's also very flexible. Um, uh, let me give you an example of flexible. Nicole's going to explain to you in a minute the difference between a webinar and a meeting and the, the flexibility within those two. Um, they can be completely sit and get and you're just lecturing and people are maybe writing questions kind of like what we're doing now. And you can interact with those questions in that format or you can be very interactive. For example, I just took three online trainings actually through the Daryl Carnegie training and what I was expecting was not what I received. What I was expecting was a sit and get. I was going to sit there, participate in a training where I was um, listening and, and just uh, absorbing the information. That was not what happened. It was very interactive. Uh, the um, host was taking us off mute so we could participate vocally. He was asking us questions. He was polling us. He would throw up a whiteboard so that we could um, type text on the whiteboard. We could draw on the whiteboard. We could throw a, an arrow up there with our names on it on the whiteboard so that he could get a sense of, of, of a poll automatically. So it was very interactive. It was the first time I'd actually taken an online training where I couldn't um, maybe like, you know, be on my phone or kind of check out a little bit because I was so, it was so interactive and so involved uh, you had to be on all the time so it's it, it varies it can be very rigid or very interactive also like I just did with the hand raising let me lower all your hands just in case um, you can collect feedback right away zoom has an opportunity for you to use polling while you're doing an online um, webinar and they also have the chat box and the question and answer box so that you're constantly collecting that feedback from participants and then finally it's easy to measure your results so um just like I did, as I questioned you right away, it's also allowing me to modify anything that I may present in the future of this webinar or meeting based on the feedback that I'm getting right away. So easy to measure those results um, and you can collect more data uh, because it's recorded, you can also see it later, okay? So what's the difference between a meeting and a webinar, Nicole? Yeah, hey folks. Um, so as the slide moves forward, there's a few significant differences. And actually what's really funny is there was already a question in the questions box asking like, hey, my interface looks different than normal. I don't have controls, I can't mute, I don't have these settings. You're in a webinar setting. So a meeting versus a webinar, I will also um, have a tertiary category called a training interface, which is gonna be a little bit of both of these. But a webinar setting typically retains a lot more control of the audience. A meeting, you come in, you can mute and unmute yourself, you've got your video controls. It's a smaller group, maybe a little bit more interactive. A webinar setting is gonna be for a larger group. You're gonna come in pre-muted, no video, et cetera. The focus is gonna be on the presentation, the presenter, and the questions and conversation, um, ability so your ability to mute unmute etc is going to be dictated by the meeting host or that webinar host so very different interfaces and i'm grateful that was already identified and we had a whole slide about it so a few other things in that meeting um, let's say you're going to have a smaller group it can be a one-on-one -on -one. you're having a meeting with a colleague 
It can be a small group that's four or five folks um, internally, externally, that's a project meeting or a board meeting. And you can also have a larger setting as a meeting, meaning that you want people to have a little bit more control and an organic feel of the setting that you're creating. You want it to be far more interactive with the participants, not just with the presenter. You also want the focus on the audio and video interface. So a meeting is going to be focused on the communication platform and secondarily that screen sharing platform. You're going to work on something together. You you want to see something, but the presentation is going to be, or the controls and the setting that that's in is going to be a little bit more subdued or not nearly as important or the focus in that meeting setting and platform. But you really want it visually appealing. You want it super easy to use. You want your users to be able to find what they need right in front of the mute, unmute questions and so on, a chat box feature so that you can have a side conversation that's open to the whole meeting space. And the difference there versus a webinar is as I mentioned, a webinar is gonna be a larger group. You can still set it for a small group, but that's typically what we're going for. It's gonna be something you want a registration process for, for instance. A webinar, you wanna get marketed out there ahead of time. Maybe it's not something you're able to send directly a meeting invite to calendars. It's more of putting out, hey, there's this event, please register. So that registration process that's already integrated into the platform can give that person reminders. A meeting, you're sending out a meeting invite and a link getting it on calendars. The webinar, as I mentioned, you also want maximum control over your attendees. You can, as a meeting organizer or webinar organizer, everyone comes in under control, if you will, and then you can release that if it's a smaller group or you want that more interactive setting, but you want the choice right off the bat. Granted, I will say in a meeting as the host, if it's getting rowdy, you typically have the ability to then mute or um, kind of control folks, but it usually isn't your default setting as it is in a webinar. In a webinar, you want more settings associated with the presentation mode. Maybe you want whiteboard and you want drawing and highlighting features. You want all those features available so that the presentation and presentation mode is your focus. It's not the group, it's not the screens, it's not the video per se, it's the presentation and the speaker and how the attendees, you, are able to view that and interact with that individual. So you want high customization of a questions box, of the hand raising feature that you guys utilize, and the ability to unmute participants to accommodate for both written and verbal comments. That's really important. Another webinar feature that's really common and that folks are using more and more is the ability to have handouts, polling, response features, all those things integrated in to keep your audience engaged and interested as they're moving along. You can have some interface of features, by the way, wet, a meeting versus a webinar. I almost said a weeding, <laughs> maybe that's a training. Um, and it goes back and forth. But this is by and large, if you're like, what's the difference? That's the difference. It's usually a control and functionality feature. Somewhere in the middle of this is a training. So there's also specific platforms for training or a way that you want to create a dynamic space for training. And you're going to have a combo of these things. A training, you're probably going to limit a size in which case you're more in that meeting functionality where you want interaction of folks, but you want high ability of presentation mode, but the ability to then switch out to have a very nice conversational mode. So you're gonna be somewhere in the middle of those two things. So what you'll find is that a lot of platforms allow you to do both of these things, but some platforms do not. And so on, if we can go to the next slide, when you're choosing a platform, are can you- Can I hang on one sec, Nicole? We got a question real quick from Bonnie. Sure. Let me allow Bonnie to talk. Bonnie, are you there? Okay, Bonnie, maybe you could type your question in the question and answer. Okay, keep going, Nicole. I will fast forward your slide. Go ahead. Sure. 
Okay, and so when you're considering a platform, whether for a meeting, whether for a webinar or both, and knowing that the majority of us are gonna be looking for a meeting platform, a webinar platform is probably for a larger group or organization like Ag Forestry or Center for Technical Development or the Washington State Conservation Commission, where we're trying to get out webinar style trainings or information sharing in a webinar style. So maybe you're looking for a meeting, but nonetheless, you really wanna consider a few things when you're looking for a platform. Features is number one. So when you're looking through, you wanna look through, do I have the ability to screen share? Do I have recording features and availability? Do I want breakout rooms and polling? Uh, do I want the ability to control the different folks? Do I want a singular platform that enables me to have both a meeting and a webinar style interface? Do I wanna focus on video or do I wanna focus on the presentation? Starting with a list of what are your primary and top features is gonna help you distinguish between the different platforms available. Because as things have gone along prior to COVID, it was a little easier to choose, oddly enough, because there was such a large discrepancy between platforms. Since COVID hit and everybody's rushed to these online platforms, they've all kind of equalized a little bit in features to some degree, costs, which I'll talk about here, and in their interfaces. However, there's still a little difference, and I'll share that in a minute here. Cost is obviously a big one. Again, thanks to COVID, the costs have largely equalized themselves. And what was mentioned earlier when Kara was talking about the cost of a meeting, providing food or bagels for your staff meeting, is about the monthly cost now of a platform. You can pay month to month, which makes it a lot easier. If you just think you're gonna use this for a few months and then um, you don't need it if things go back to quote normal, so you can do that. And lastly, accessibility is really important here. So some of these platforms on their basic paid feature and particularly on any free feature is web only, there's no phone. So be very cognizant if you're doing a meeting function that you have accessibility features for everyone to come in as well as closed captioning ability. There's only a couple interfaces. I think the Google platform is the only one that has that ready to go. Some of the other ones, it's a high level paid feature, but really valuable if you're really trying to increase accessibility of your platform and your meeting. There's of course recording and posting. Does the platform do that for you? Do you have to have outside technical savvy to get those things done? So a lot to consider here. In the next slide, I want to show you a couple of top ones. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. In fact, there was a detailed webinar on this last week that the Center for Technical Development hosted on how to choose a virtual meeting platform. And if you can see the link at the bottom there, if you go to our website under training, you can find a recording to that longer webinar. But just to list the big top ones here, and honestly, yes, there's a large number of them out there, but these are the ones that have risen to the top and to the challenge over the last handful of months. Zoom and GoToMeeting are probably your top ones, WebEx right behind for that meeting platform. Zoom and GoToWebinar, or even more especially GoToTraining, are good for webinar platforms as well, where you have what we described in those webinar features. Things like Google Meet and Microsoft Teams are good for internal or smaller meetings, but they're still lacking on really having good presentation features, but they come on a greater platform. So it's something to consider as well for cost and for features, and if you wanna integrate it into a larger network. So there are some things that you wanna consider when choosing it. Again, I direct you to um, that other webinar that we did for how to choose that. So the next part about once you've chosen, chosen your platform, you've decided if you're having a meeting or webinar is to plan said webinar or meeting so that it's really successful. And I'm gonna turn it over to Shauna, who's now gonna go into how to plan that and how to conduct a really successful tips and tricks for those webinars or meetings. Thanks, Nicole. Hmm. Okay, you've chosen your platform, you pick one. You're gonna go with Zoom, you're gonna go with GoToMeeting, uh, you're gonna use Google Meet, uh, whatever you've chosen as your platform, 
And now you know you need to get some people together. You need to get some work done, whether that's going to be a meeting structure or a webinar structure. You've got some key decisions to make in planning that event for it to go well. So first you want to decide, is this going to be more dynamic, more interactive? Do I want to have a meeting, smaller group of folks? Maybe that's a staff meeting. Maybe that's a small committee meeting, things like that. Or do you really want to have a webinar structure for a larger group where you're going to present a lot of information? You, you want to have those background controls and things like that. You need to decide, are we going to go with a meeting? Are you going to go with a webinar? Um, choose that platform. That's super important because that'll dictate what sort of functionality and features you can offer as part of your online event. Uh, choose the date, right? This, this sounds like it might be really easy to do, but you want to keep in mind, are there other things going on that if you schedule your meeting or webinar at the same time, you're going to lose attendees? Uh, you want to keep in mind the time of day. Uh, if you're planning something that uh, could be multiple time zones, uh, you don't want to plan this to start at 4 a.m. Pacific time so it can start at, you know, 8 a.m. Or, or what have you, Eastern time, so keep that in mind. And the length. Um, all day webinars are just brutal for folks, right? All day online earbuds or, or staring at a computer screen. So uh, really make a mindful decision about the length of your online event. Then do you want to record this? This webinar today is being recorded. You want to be able to refer back to it later. Uh, maybe be able to convey that information to folks who couldn't participate at the date and time that you chose. Uh, recording, if you're a public agency, become a public record. So that could be a consideration about whether or not you record your online event. Uh, moderators and speakers, you really want to identify who those folks will be early on in the planning for your events. Uh, are you going to have one moderator, two moderators? If it's a large group, I highly recommend a, a two moderator approach. I can talk a little bit more about that later. Line up and confirm those speakers. Make sure you've really laid the groundwork for a successful online event. Set your agenda. Do you need handouts? Do those handouts need to be sent out ahead of time? Do you want folks to have read materials and come to the meeting or the webinar with questions? So a lot of things to think about as you plan as well as promotion. So if you're holding a meeting, uh, you might want to send individual invitations to those that you want to participate. Or if you're holding a webinar, you might want to promote in a different way via social media or an all staff email or things like that, email marketing uh, to really get more attendees. And remind folks. Now, there's a careful balance with reminding folks. Uh, some platforms can send out automatically a lot of emails to remind those who have registered for your webinar that it's coming up. So be mindful of those settings. You can often limit uh, one reminder email, two, three reminder emails, as well as a follow-up email. So think about those things. Be mindful. Uh, make those decisions as you're planning. And once you've got that all set out, it's much easier the day of your event for everything to go smoothly. So uh, next slide, please. So we're going to recap that prep work, right? You've got your schedule, your date and time. You've got your platform. Um, Zoom and GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar allow you to schedule a specific date time length for a meeting or a webinar and generate an individual link and oftentimes an individual call-in number. So you want to do that well ahead so you can provide that information to your attendees, confirm your moderators and speakers, send those invitations, advertise, prep those paperwork items, your agenda or your handout, uh, practice. This is big. Uh, we did it for today and I highly recommend it. Uh, schedule a dry run, especially if you're going to have a large group webinar. You want to identify those tech issues that could happen early on and be able to fix them, 
iron them out, whatever you need to do. Uh, maybe you need to trim some of the presentation in order to get it in the time you've planned. Uh, a dry run practice is highly recommended and worth the time. So you've done all of this prep work. You're like, man, my checklist is complete. I've marked all the boxes. I'm ready to go. Next slide. So let's do it. Let's do it. Day of, okay, your online event, your meeting, your webinar is coming. Oh my gosh, the clock is ticking, right? You're a little bit anxious. I hope my computer doesn't crash. I hope my slides advance. Start your meeting or webinar early. As the organizer, the host, the moderator, whatever you want to call that role, get onto your platform. Make sure everything's working. Quote, unquote, start your meeting 10 or 15 minutes early and invite all of your moderators and speakers to join early as well. You can do sound checks. You can make sure that folks' video is working or their audio is working or they can share their screen. Um, you can do all of those things beforehand, fix tech issues before you really get started and hit your, your hard start time and your attendees won't see those behind the scenes things that, that can often cause a hitch in an online event. So start early, super important. Next. Engage your audience right away. Now, if you'd like to jump around like a little green frog and that floats your boat, by all means. But I have another way that's pretty easy for you to engage your audience right away. So how do you want folks to know that when they click that link you said or they dial in that number, that they're in the right place? Am I in the right room? Is Zoom working? Am I here? How, how will they know? The easiest way to do that is to use an introduction slide. And I'm, I'm going to show you an example of a slide that I've used in a few webinars that I've moderated. You can see that on your screen. Often you can put logos and things like this, really label that folks are in the right place when they join your meeting. You want the title, you know, what is this meeting about? You want information about how to participate. So in some uh, platforms, you have to raise your hand. So Zoom and, and GoToWebinar, you raise your hand by clicking on an icon. Or you can use a question box, or sometimes it's a chat feature. When folks join early, that gives them an opportunity to click around and get a little bit familiar with the platform and how to participate before the actual event gets underway. So folks won't feel so, so overwhelmed trying to participate in that online environment. Sometimes audio issues happen, and maybe your computer audio isn't working, you need to switch over to a phone number. It's helpful to include that information on your intro slide, if that's available in your platform, so that folks can do a little troubleshooting on their own to make sure that their, their audio works, that they can hear the presentations. Then on this sample, I've also included a few key points from the agenda for this particular uh, online call that we had, online webinar. That's helpful. You're like, oh yeah, I forgot we were gonna we were gonna talk about this shared work program, right? I, I wanna pull this note out that I had over here, right? Help people prepare to really fully engage in the conversation. And then I always include at the bottom of this intro slide the contact information for the moderators. So uh, oftentimes someone might text you or email you on the side. I'm having trouble with my audio, I'm having trouble. Uh, share in my screen or my video, and sometimes you can troubleshoot those things on the side. So the intro slide is an easy thing to do, preps up pretty quickly, uh, really engages folks right off the bat, helps draw their attention away from maybe their email box or other things that are going on, you know, in a busy work day. Very important. So let's go ahead and move on. Next. So after you welcome people, right, you've got your intro slide up, it's high noon today, time to start. We want to get going. Welcome folks, introduce yourself, introduce your other moderators. If you're using a multiple moderator approach, briefly walk through what folks are seeing on that intro slide. Sometimes you get folks who can only call in or only have an audio connection. And when you walk through and speak through that intro information, then they get to hear it too. 
uh, review your agenda. You know, what are we going to talk about today? When are we going to wrap up? Make sure you're, you're telling people what to expect for the day. Next. Moderation. Moderation is key uh, in a smaller group setting or just an online meeting. Typically, one moderator uh, can do the job. And by that, I mean if you need to mute and unmute people, or you need to monitor a question box or a chat feature. If you have a smaller group, it's manageable for one person to be minding all those controls behind the scenes. If you have a larger group, and I would say 15 or more people, just as a, a round place to start, two moderators works well. And that's two folks behind the scenes who can monitor the question box, mute and unmute people, share screens, uh, be doing all of that behind the scenes, clicking around, that makes the overall event go really smoothly. A two moderator approach uh, has worked really well for some of the larger webinars that the commission has hosted in the past. Engage your audience. So not only with that intro slide, but throughout. And you saw Kara do that when we started out. You know, please raise your hand if you've been on a, an international webinar. Build in questions and opportunities for your audience to really participate. And, you know, ask them, how does my sound check? Can you hear me loud and clear? Please type that in the question box. These are things that keep people's attention on your online event and folks engaged in the content that you're delivering. Because I'll tell you, nowadays, a lot of folks have two computer screens and that Email one over here is really distracting, right? You want to try to really keep people engaged in what you're presenting and your, your content. The Q&A is super important. And for a, a more dynamic type of meeting where you really want to have an open flow discussion, consider Q&A throughout, right? Pause frequently. Build in those pauses into your presentation for questions. Um, just just ad hoc. Uh, larger webinar where maybe you have a hundred or so people even participating, you might want to set certain times. You know, have a time slot for questions after each presentation or after a group of presentations on a particular topic. Super important that folks don't just type in a question right up front at the beginning and, and maybe you don't get to it until an hour in. Um, that can, you know, make, make engagement really difficult for that person who asked the question. So consider how you're going to structure Q&A uh, in your webinar and try to be as responsive as you can. Mind the clock. This can be tough to do. Some features, some platforms actually have a timer that you can set uh, over, over in the corner. Um, keep, keep an eye on that. Maybe have your, your cell phone handy or something like that so you're keeping track because you want all the speakers to have adequate time to present their information. And plenty of time for that Q&A and open discussion as well. So you've been through your whole webinar. You're, you're wrapping up, right? You're at the very end, almost over, no technological difficulties, no crash and burn. Make sure when you wrap up your webinar, that you're leaving folks with some action, that you're letting them know uh, how to participate in the future, where to go for more information, how to contact the speakers or the moderators if they have feedback. You know, did the webinar go well? Was there something that didn't work very well that you could adjust in the future? Make sure you leave folks with those actionable pieces of advice. You know, it's a, it's a call to action, if you will. And uh, it could be go sign up for your district newsletter or please go check out this video on YouTube. It could be anything like that. Uh, but end it, wrap it up with a dynamic action item when you do that. And whew, now the webinar or your online meeting or event is over. It went well. You got through it. But there are things to consider after your webinar. And for that, I'm going to turn it back over to Nicole. Okay, thank you, Shauna. Okay, so you've conducted your, you planned your webinar, you've conducted your webinar, now what? Well, 
The best part about conducting a webinar, specifically if you record it, is that you can go back and review, see what worked and what didn't. Get feedback is the best way to continue to improve your webinar and your pre presentation thereof. So the first bullet here talks about conduct a post-event meeting for all presenters. So when it's done, connect back with your presenters. You can do that via email. You can kind of come back to the space and say, what worked for you guys? What didn't? Uh, how could we have given you better guidance on you know, connecting in? This is really important if you have issues during a webinar or a meeting where things go awry, someone's technology is absolutely not working. Come back afterwards and figure out how you could have troubleshooted that during the event, but also before it even happened. That's really important. So keeping track of what worked and what didn't helps you improve in the future. Personally, I learn far more from my mistakes and failures than I do from my successes, right? We remember those. How can I prevent that from happening again? So with a lot of meetings and webinars, you're not going to be perfect the first time. It takes a lot of practice. You keep doing it. You get that feedback. You improve things. You enhance it. And you keep getting better and better. Typically, the way to do that is with practice. So you just do this often. Also, you want to reconnect with your attendees. You don't want to have a webinar and then just disappear. Make sure that either the interface that you're using already is connecting with attendees with a thank you for coming webinar or email or post. If it doesn't have that feature set up, then you need to send something out. You now know who is here in your meeting space and you've got record of that. So connect back with your attendees in some way. If you're not connecting directly with them, connect it back to your website or other platform you have where you're including a recording of the presentation. Any materials that were shared, including the slide set or handouts or links or any reference, make sure those are all included on your website or in an email or anything else that goes back out to attendees because that's really what they want. Even things that come up in a questions box. So if you open it up for questions and someone asks something, you provide a link in there. If it feels relevant, make sure that also gets in these links provided uh, back to attendees. Better to give them more than not enough. Also send a separate message to the people who are unable to attend. So that is either those who registered or who were on your uh, meeting invitation list who were not able to be at that meeting, send them a specific link saying, hey, we missed you. Here's a recording of the meeting. If you're not recording it, at least here's the materials or notes from that meeting that you can access. So you just wanna make sure that you're always reconnecting with people and that they have that uh, follow up from you. And again, not only are you trying to get feedback to improve, but you also want to stay connected to your attendees so that they're kind of feeling a wrap up or a finalization of that interaction with you. This is really important if you're doing a series of events, uh, then you really want to keep them enrolled. If this is a one on one meeting with someone or a small group meeting, even just sending out as simply as an email afterwards that says, thanks guys, here are the notes from our meeting, um, is good. So it's just good practice to continue that. Obviously, the depth of your follow-up depends on the simplicity of the meeting or the complexity of the webinar that you had. Next. All right, finally. You need to share your success, right? And the great thing about webinars or meetings is that they can be recorded. And so you have uh, them in perpetuity to go back to and to look at again and to use for future uh, opportunities. So for example, you can bet them in, into your website, maybe that has similar content. If you've ever been to the Center for Technical Development's website, you'll see they have a very specific content boxes. And so you can put that re relevant content, those relevant meetings or webinars in those content specific areas within your website. You can also share those short clips on say your blog, your website, maybe you have a newsletter that you can, an online newsletter you can put a link to, any of your social media accounts, including YouTube, 
you can put some clips on there as well. You can also include these in emails, um, the opportunities for webinar, webinars in, or online meetings in emails for prospects, right? Um, so for example, Ag Forestry, uh, class 43 was supposed to start this fall, although we're doing a, a pause year. And so they're not gonna be starting for the, until the following year. So um, in helping them kind of get acquainted with Ag Forestry, doing the webinars is a nice way to offer them some things um, and hopefully build the, the repertoire of getting them to know your organization a little bit better during some of those times. You can play clips with, uh, of your webinars within your other webinars. So especially if you have a series of webinars, you might want to review something that you covered in, a, in maybe a first uh, series uh, webinar in your second series set, a webinar, uh, reminding people of what you've covered in the past. You can also use them like mini commercials. Um, I would think that would be a lot of fun on your social media to use those short clips, uh, like lit little mini commercials to kind of prep maybe for future webinars or future online meetings that you're going to have that you want to encourage people to attend. Uh, finally, you get to track um, key success metrics. So at the end of this webinar, Zoom is great because it, it allows me to save really great information. So they're going to have compiled an Excel spreadsheet for me that lists all of the attendees who are actually on the webinar, not that just registered. I have that in a separate Excel spreadsheet, but the ones that actually participated in this webinar, not only do I get to know who they are, but I also know how long they were on the webinar. So did they participate in the whole thing? Did a large chunk of them drop off at a certain time? That helps me with that feedback, knowing perhaps what content was relevant and where I might have lost my audience or gained more. Um, maybe people couldn't make it at 12 o'clock and 12.30, lots of people started coming on. So those kinds of uh, metrics are available from these platforms that you can use to make your next webinar, your next online meeting even more successful. So with that, once again, I wanna thank you guys for your time. Uh, we are at our question and answer phase. So Shauna, if you'll join us again back on online, very good. Um, we will be happy to answer any of your questions that you may have. Um, I, if you would like to raise your hand, I can unmute you. And, or if you would like to write your question in the question and answer box, we will get to them. I do want to address Cindy's questions. Uh, I, I typed the answer actually in Tom's question. So Cindy, if you go back to Tom's question, you can see the answer to that, but it was yes. She asked if there's an opportunity for the presenters, Nicole and Shauna and I, to get the webinar ready before attendees start coming online. And yes, Zoom has a feature, a practice feature, set up with your webinar so you can start your practice webinar and then you don't actually uh, go live until you hit the go live button or the broadcast button and that's when every all the attendees can see you and see what's on your screen and tell them they're going to be holding and waiting for the host to join so i hope that answers that question go to webinar and go to same feature but i don't think go to yep. meeting or zoom meeting does it's a webinar specific feature correct Uh, there was a couple other questions that I also, I answered a few, I can reiterate if folks didn't see it. Um, there was a reference back to the CTD webinar I mentioned about how to choose a virtual platform and it asked about bandwidth. And while we didn't go into deep detail, it is pretty important to consider uh, the bandwidth when you're choosing a platform or even when you're hosting one that you may want to shut off a lot of the video functions just to enable people's bandwidth. You certainly want a call-in feature for those who don't have the bandwidth to access that Wi-Fi connection. That's part of that accessibility, but they typically will list that in the features of a platform. Something like Microsoft Teams uses a huge bandwidth. It's, it'll just some people can't use it, period, in our office where they can use GoToWebinar or, excuse me, GoToMeeting or Webinar or like the Zoom meeting function. They take a lot less bandwidth. When you do things like backgrounds and whatnot, um, while these are really fun, they can also kind of drain that a little bit. So it's a good consideration. We have a new question from Valerie. She says, do you recommend a moderator for board meetings or just a free-for-all format for public access? 
Well, free for all format might be entertaining. Um, it's really going to drag down the time for you to get through your business in a board meeting. And oftentimes, where I've seen this work really well is the, the chair of the board uh, is, is the moderator and is leading, you know, the, the board and the public and the staff that are participating through each item of business on the agenda. And uh, one for district in particular almost uh, works out a bit of a script to help the chair stick to, uh, you know, okay, that's right, we need to, we need to call for public comment. Uh, on this particular item before we take a vote on it, or we're going to go to this presenter, or we're going to call on this staff person to speak to this agenda item, so that that keeps it moving really smoothly. Um, also, for public access, you might want the ability to mute and unmute people, so you're not hearing the dog barking in the background, the traffic, the tractor, whatever the case may be. You know, and that way you can unmute specific people when they want to share their comments. So long story short, yes, I do recommend it. One thing I also, sorry, Kara, I no, also want to add that in this similar context um, is you probably noticed today that Shauna and I were saying next on our slides. So we had Kara kind of post the whole thing and she ran the slide set versus even though we were in a cohesive slide set from popping from one person to the next to the next. So similarly, what we were talking about bandwidth and or just keeping a flow is that you want to make sure that you've got a really cohesive flow. You want to minimize the from here to there and ping ponging around. So even though we were able to move around in our presentation style, a tip is to definitely have a singular presentation um, flow throughout. When you're doing that, try not to put animations on it. It takes forever to say next, 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 when you're having someone else like hit every one of your bullet points. So also a really key thing um, to have there. But this is also predicated, the reason I bring this full circle, there was also a question about whiteboard application. And when we do this, it means Shauna and I are not in presenter mode. So when you are the presenter, you have special privileges to interact with that presentation. So you can use whiteboard features, you can advance, you can do different things. So I am just able to say next when I'm not the present presentation mode, but I'm the presenter. So something to really mm -hmm. consider when you're bringing other presenters on board that are mixed um, people in a singular slide set and or for bumping around from your presentation, now you're gonna pop up a web slide, you're gonna pop up a different document, have all of those up at once so you can cohesively go. Also, when you are in presenter mode or you've given that to someone else, there's typically a pause screen feature that you can pause your screen while you go find something, pull it up, and then you unpause it and now it's that new thing. So really know your controls as you roll through there so that you can be a little bit more efficient. It, the clunkiness always kills a presentation. People notice it, they get a little annoyed mm -hmm. by it. Um, there is that. So it goes back to we're talking about practicing and have what that control is. If you're in a meeting versus a webinar function, make sure you know those and you're granting them as needed. I want to say- I'll something. build on that. Oh, sorry, Kara. I'll let you talk in just a minute, Shauna. I do want to say before we uh, lose too many uh, participants um, that may not have a question or answer, I do want to, uh, make you aware of our next Ag Forestry to go webinar in August, which will be a legislative update with Senator Judy Warnick and Senator Kevin Vandeweg. Uh, that's going to be on August 26th, also during the lunchtime hour. So I hope you'll uh, join us. You can register for that at the agforestry.org website. Um, and uh, that's going to be an exciting uh, webinar as well. So sorry, Shauna, right back to you. No worries. I was just going to say, you probably noticed today not a lot of other distracting pop-ups coming up on Kara's screen. As she's moderating this behind the scenes and advancing those slides, if you have email notifications or other platforms or programs you run on your computer that typically pop things up in the lower right corner, boy, you want to close all of that. 
you want to shut down your email box, you want to turn off all of those things so that there aren't any of those visual distractions coming up in the middle of your online event. Um, and I did see a question, if I could uh, respond to Sherry's question about the Zoom platform and not being able to download it due to being a state agency. Um, I actually can't download it either, Sherry, but there's a way that you can join and use Zoom via your browser. So you might try that option instead of downloading uh, the application onto your computer. How about the question of um, closed captioning? Nicole, did you, you kind of addressed that before. Uh, Google Meets has built-in closed captioning, um, but the other platforms don't, and you have to, to look outside for a third party. Yeah, I don't have a lot of experience using that feature, unfortunately. Uh, but yes, I believe it's like a, a plug-in, an add-in. Um, and a lot of uh, the different kind of platforms have those types of features when you kind of get technically savvy. For instance, within Zoom, you can add your background, but in GoToMeeting, it is at least now, you have to use uh, an outside platform to put it up there, but the meeting interface will recognize it. So unlike Google Meet that has it directly incorporated, you do have to use a third party platform for it. If someone in the audience has a suggestion for a successful and easy one that they have used, please post it up. Otherwise, whatever platform, if you're using the GoTo or Zoom or otherwise, look on their website and search for closed captioning and see what is the specific third party that they um, actually recommend and or will support because they don't necessarily support them all. Okay, we have another question. In Zoom, can a moderator hear the call in only folks in order to unmute them if they have a question or comment, or do you just have points where you unmute everyone? Or hands. <laughs> That's to you, Kara. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's going to depend on how you've set it up, whether it's a meeting or a webinar. With the webinars, we have set it up to mute everybody, and I actually have to go in person by person and unmute them. So no, if they've called in, there's not an option for them to, well, from the mobile platform, I'm not sure if there's an option for them to raise their hand, but that was why we offered that opportunity as well, just in case they weren't able to send us a question and answer through the question and answer chat box. Because I know when you're using it on a mobile device, when you're joining one of these uh, webinars or online meetings from a mobile device, it's a much different format. And because your screen is so much smaller, you can usually only see what's going on and to be able to navigate all of the options is much more difficult. So I don't know if you guys have experience from the mobile side. Yeah, I can add a little bit to that too. So again, it's gonna be slightly different depending on your platform that you're using. But it's true, if you come in as a webinar, typically you can set, if everyone comes in auto-muted already, you can not have that. But once they're in, like right now, Kara as the organizer could unmute everybody at once. And then she could go back in and auto-mute certain people that don't know how to use their own mute button, let's say. In a meeting, you're gonna give everyone the control, but the host can always take it back. You can always, have that selection to unmute all or mute all or mute or unmute an individual. So it is a feature of pretty much all platforms for the most part that when you're the controller, and those are these big ones, things like Teams, etc. cetera, um, you can actually mute an, an individual. Like if I'm like, gosh, he has so much background noise and I can mute a participant and they can unmute themselves. So um, it's a little different for platforms, but by and large, I think that's the same. And or we talked about the hand feature is typically there when you're on the web interface, you can raise your hand if you want to be unmuted. But you're right, if I call into this webinar or a web meeting and I'm listening, I have zero of those features. If, if everyone's pre-muted, I can't raise my hand, I can't ask a question and it can be a little frustrating. So if that is the case, if it's a board meeting, let's say, what I would suggest for you if you have that feature because you have to allow the public interface is that you take pauses and say, okay, we're now going to unmute all participants. If you have a question, 
please talk now. And then you have to say, we're now remuting all participants. So take a bunch of breaks, unmute everybody, allow them to talk, and then mute them again. So just create those blocks. If you know there are people who have only called in and that's the only way they can talk is if you unmute them. Next question. And you can see. Oh, sorry. Uh, you sorry. can see. Sorry, with GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar, you can see folks who are just calling in. It'll say caller number one, caller number two, caller number three. So if you wanted to individually go through and call on those folks, do you have a, you could do it that way as well. But you can see uh, folks who only call in with the GoTo platform. And then how about suggestions for breakout rooms or sub-meetings? Sure, and by the way, I want to say that Ashley sent a little note that says, you can raise your hand on the phone. Ashley, I wonder if this is platform specific. She said that you have to hit the following star six, unmute, star nine, raise hand. So there is a way. Um, so maybe that's something, if there is that way, look ahead of time and tell everyone on the audience that feature as well. So I just wanted to pop in there. Um, so I will talk just really briefly about the breakout or sub meeting. Not all platforms allow that. So it's, I think Zoom and GoToTraining are the only ones I know that have these kind of breakout meetings. Again, no, it's a really popular feature, so more and more interfaces will probably start adopting it at a higher paid level, I'm sure, but it's coming in. So how you use those, really specific to you. It's mostly for training or for some type of a meeting where it's a big group and you say, okay, we're gonna now break into smaller groups to discuss this question. We're gonna come back, you're gonna nominate one person to provide your responses back. To, totally the same as you would do in a regular room. So use it that way, and it's kind of fun. Then you're small, you can all talk together, and then you come back. So I do suggest them if you can find the right context for them. Ashley also made the other suggestion about the waiting room. So Zoom has a waiting room that doesn't allow attendees to come into the webinar until the host allows them to. And we've, I've used both sides. I prefer not to just because I'm already moderating the question and answer, the chat, the thing. And so you have to continue to be letting people in because not everybody joins before the webinar, right? So they, they join throughout the webinar. So you're, some people could be hanging out in that waiting room for quite a long period of time if you're not watching that very closely. So it's up to you whether to allow everybody in when they join or put them in that wait waiting room and then you manually have to allow each individual in to the meeting or the webinar. And I'll add just a smidge of that by saying that know your platform. So your platform has all these features before the meeting or webinar you can turn on and off. That one is really specific for Zoom because of all the Zoom bombing that happened and the security issues. Um, I, go, I think Teams has the same thing when you invite outside folks in, it's a security feature. So you may not want to turn it off, but as Kara said, it can be really annoying if it's a big group and you're trying to you know, get started and host and look for people. So in that vein, I suggest you oftentimes have two people who are running a webinar style meeting um, <laughs> with you that one of you is presenting and doing and you've got someone who's moderating all those questions for you, moderating the room space. So having two people for a larger meeting or webinar is super valuable. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of that back end, uh, Nicole, I know with Zoom, because that's the platform I use, mm -hmm. there are so many boxes to check and uncheck for each of your meetings and your webinars. So you really need to spend a, a, a significant amount of time making sure that you have all the right features turned on. For example, you guys can't see the participant list right now. I did not have that feature checked. Um, so those are all individual things that you can turn on or turn off for each of your meetings. And it's important for you to understand who the audience is and what the purpose of those meetings and webinars are so that you can fine tune all of those specific uh, things within your platform that you want to be able to do. Even raising your hand, that's an option I had to turn on for participants. So either I want them to raise their hand or I don't. Um, all of those are options. Very important. Mm -hmm. And check that often. Because of COVID, a lot of features have been new in all of these platforms. So you might feel like you're a go-to meeting proficient from a few months back, 
and you go in there to your admin console and go, oh my gosh, I, I can have 50 people now and I could only have five a month ago. They're really upping the features. So check that often. Yeah. So I found that things I found as a limiter and go to are now available because they were so popular in Zoom and vice versa. So yeah, like I mentioned, they're all starting to really equalize, which makes choosing a little bit harder, weirdly enough, but there's so fewer options now. There's really just, you know, a handful that have risen to the top. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'm trying to make sure that we, Rachel, what are the pros and cons of allowing participants to see the participant list? I would say a pro can be that, um, let's say you know uh, your colleague from another conservation district just watched the same uh, webinar, was on the same webinar that you were, and it really fired you up to talk more about that content. You can say, well, gosh, my friend Dan from my other district was, was on the webinar. I'm going to give him a call, and we can talk about this some more, right, because you can, you can see who was there. Um, in the same vein, you can see who's not there. So if there's a key person that you would expect to be participating in a webinar, you can see that they weren't there. Maybe you send them the link to the recording or something afterwards, or you share your notes with that person. So um, those are some pros that I can think of. One of the other things about being able to interact with the other participants is the chat feature. So you can chat with the other participants. Perhaps you know them. Um, one thing you need to understand in some platforms those chats are also saved so some people think those chats are are privileged and not communicated with the with the the presenter but all the chats are saved afterwards and saved into a file and so those are saved as well that's my understanding yes yes any other questions if not, I would like to thank you again for joining Ag Forestry to go uh, for our lunchtime webinar series. Again, next month, August 26th, we'll be having a legislative update with Senator Judy Warnick and Kevin Vandewig, Senator v Vandewig. <laughs> They're just going to be giving us uh, an update on uh, what's going on with the legislature. So I think that's going to be a pretty important webinar and you're going to be able to ask them lots of questions. So. Um, thank you again for everybody's time. I'd like to thank my co-presenters, Dr. Nicole Embertson and Shauna Joy. You guys were a pleasure to work with. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. A pleasure to be here. Have a good day, everyone.